For my second chapter, I sought to understand how a black bear's conflict history impacts the probability that they will be recaptured exploiting anthropogenic habitats in the future. So if a bear has been previously captured in response to a nuisance complaint and has been marked and aversively conditioned and become a problem bear in our database, is it more likely to be subsequently recaptured in anthropogenic habitats, habitats um, that are human transformed, so neighborhoods, cities, um, urban areas. In other words, once a cub is taught by its mother, the sow here, to forage in a dumpster, is it going to continue foraging in that dumpster as it becomes an adult? Is it going to teach its cubs how to forage in dumpsters? So herein, we're going to hone in on 3,690 spatially explicit captures, which are the black dots, as well as 668 dead recoveries, those with GPS coordinates, which are the red dots. We explicitly categorized the entire landscape using national land cover databases from 2001, 2006, and 2011. So here the urban areas are color coded in this bluish gray. So these are areas where there's low, medium, and high development. And then the pink area is the wildland urban interface. So it's that buffer zone, that transition between wildland habitats and human dominated habitats. It's the interface. So that's denoted in pink. So we chose a 500 meter buffer interface around all urban areas to form a donut, if you will, around urban areas. And I'll show you why we chose 500 meters in just a second when we look at some GPS data. Uh, yellow is agricultural areas so that represents croplands and hay pastures and then the remaining wildlands are in this light green color and they're primarily composed of deciduous forests and woody wetlands. Um, there's also a handful of state parks uh, which are in green and you can see the hash marks there, um, the checkered marks uh, representing the state parks. But this landscape is a lot different uh, than the West, where we have ample public lands. You can see um, this is very much a heterogeneous landscape, right? Um, with very small pockets of contiguous wildland area. So some captures clearly represent bears that are exploiting uh, anthropogenic resources. So this is a sow, this is her den, and she denned right behind this baseball field uh, right here. She is just a few miles uh, from southern Manhattan. So this black bear is not really subsisting on acorns and white-tailed deer fawns. Um, this bear is an urban bear. It's clearly living on trash and other anthropogenic resources. Clearly an urban bear. However, other capture sites were a little less clear cut. So this is a bear den and it's in the Stokes State Forest. But you can see, here's the scale here. So this is 500 meters, this distance right here, which is about five football fields. So we're three and a half football fields from the nearest trash can. So is this a wildland bear? Is this an urban bear? Or is this what we should call the interface between wildland and urban areas? So 
This is why we incorporated this interface habitat, this transitional zone between developed human dominated areas like the neighborhoods here in blue and then the wildland areas like the forests here in green. So these are GPS locations from a single sow, a single female black bear. She's got a GPS collar on. Uh, it's uh, fixing locations every hour. And this is one summer's worth of data. But what you see here is she shows a high affinity for these woods right on the outskirts of the neighborhood. And then what those data showed was at night, she would make regular forays into the neighborhoods, hitting trash cans that people left out the night before trash pickup or exploiting other anthropogenic resources. But so here's a bear, right, that can easily be captured in the woods but is exploiting anthropogenic resources. So any bear that was captured within 500 uh, meters, uh, half of a kilometer from a neighborhood was considered in the interface zone which turns out to be a really important place um, when we think about bear management in landscapes like this. For these analyses, we again use the highly versatile tool, multi-state capture mark re-encounter methods. But this time, we were interested in estimating the probability of bears transitioning from wild land states into the interface state, or into the urban state, or into farmlands. So we're looking at the probability that we capture a bear in the woods. What's the probability that the next recapture is going to be in an urban area? So the first signal that jumped out at us right off the bat was the significantly large proportion of mortality recoveries that occurred in this interface zone right around the neighborhood. So despite composing only 18% of the landscape, the interface, this donut, this transition zone between the neighborhoods and the woodlands accounted for 44.5% of the mortalities. So in these woods, this is where bears had a very high probability of being harvested. So it <laughs> turns out, uh, despite what hunters might claim, they don't go deep into the backcountry to harvest their bears. Uh, the vast majority of the harvests uh, were uh, in wooded areas not far from neighborhoods in this interface. The other thing that happens in the interface is vehicles are going to get out of the neighborhood and so speed limits are going to pick up on these roads. And so in the interface zone, bears have a very high probability of being struck by vehicles as opposed to in the neighborhoods, um, which is a uh, bit of a refuge. So in the neighborhoods, in the urban areas, uh, we only recovered 7.9% of our mortality. So this, the most dangerous habitat in northwestern New Jersey is the interface, right? This is where bears can be harvested and struck by vehicles. And the safest place to be, if you're a black bear, is in smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood where you can't be harvested, right? We don't want bullets flying in our neighborhood and speed limits are low. So we have uh, significantly fewer traffic collisions. So only 7.9% of the mortalities recovered in urban areas. All right, so the numbers in these boxes are transition probabilities. They're generated from our best fitting model. And the way to think about a transition probability is, so the red lines uh, are problem bears. Those are bears that have a conflict history, meaning they've been captured in response to a nuisance complaint. 
Problem bears that are captured in wildland areas in the forest, their next capture, their next subsequent capture, these bears have a 37% chance of being captured in this interface zone. Compare that to normal bears. And by normal, I just mean that the bear has never been captured in response to a nuisance complaint. A normal bear that's captured in wildland habitats has only about a 13% chance of being recaptured on its next capture in the interface. And it doesn't matter from which habitat we look at. Uh, here's farms. So um, problem bears, uh, after being captured on a farm, they have a 38% chance of being captured in the interface compared to just 18% with normal bears. Very similar here, you're captured in a neighborhood, the next capture, 38% chance that you're going to be in the interface. Okay, so how does black bear behavior problem versus normal impact the probability that bears will transition to the interface? Problem bears. Bears that have been identified as a nuisance are spending disproportionate amounts of time in the interface. And that's consistent with the data that we saw in the last chapter. Um, remember, problem bears have a disproportionate likelihood of being harvested. And the interface is the most dangerous zone where most of the harvest occurs. So harvest is disproportionately uh, selecting problem bears from this dangerous interface zone. Similarly, if we look at transition probabilities of problem versus normal bears into urban habitats, just as we would predict, problem bears are significantly more likely to be recaptured in urban habitats after previously being recaptured in the interface. So 19% chance compared to just 3% chance. 14% chance of transitioning from the woods into the neighborhood, and uh, again, about a 15% chance here. Um, so similarly, problem bears are transitioning more to urban areas and the interface. They're disproportionately using these urban habitats once they have become food conditioned, once they have been identified as a nuisance bear. So how does black bear conflict history impact the probability that they will exploit anthropogenic habitats in the future? It's a very strong predictor. It is the best predictor. So once bears become a problem, they are more frequently transitioning to urban and interface habitats. So in Montana, on all of our uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks trucks, this was years ago, but we put stickers on all of our trucks, a fed bear is a dead bear. So if you don't remember anything from this case study, please remember, do not feed the bears because once they uh, get a taste for people food, then they want more. What else did we learn? Urban and agricultural areas were relatively safe. Uh, bears are less likely to be harvested and they're less likely to be hit by vehicles in these habitats compared to in the interface and in wildland habitats. So what all this suggests is that in addition to a well-regulated harvest, we also need to invest in education. We have got to prevent the initial food conditioning in bears. We've got to prevent them from getting into people's trash. This is key to reducing anthropogenic transitions because normal bears don't transition into anthropogenic habitats all that much, but once they become a problem, they're going to regularly visit those neighborhoods.